فَعَلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكَ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ مُتَقَلَّبَكُمْ وَمَثْوَاكُمْ لما أن أمته ستفترق على ثلاث وسبعين فرقة كلها في النار إلا واحدة وهي من كان على مثل ما عليه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وأصحابه ولا يهولنك كثرة الجمع فالحق هو الحق وإن لم يأخذ به إلا واحد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم The name of Allah, the most gracious, the ever merciful الحمد لله رب العالمين All praise is due to Allah, the Lord, creator and sustainer of all things والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلق الله أجمعين And may Allah raise the rank of and grant peace to the most noble of all of the creation of Allah نبينا محمد our prophet Muhammad وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين And likewise that of his family and companions all of them in entirety أما بعد as for what follows, then we thank Allah Ta'ala for allowing us to witness these greatest days of the year, and most virtuous days of the year. Mukabbirina muwahidina, saying Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, Wallahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, wa lillahi alhamd, declaring His greatness and singling him out with all of our acts of worship, we ask that he grant us understanding in his religion, and that he forgive us of our sins, and that he enable us to do those deeds that he loves from us and is pleased with, and that he enable us to fast tomorrow on the day of Arafah, for that day is something that the Prophet ﷺ expected that Allah would as a result of a person fasting on that day, have the sins of the previous year as well as the coming sins of the next year forgiven for him because of his fasting of that one day. May Allah Ta'ala enable us to fast tomorrow in safety and in good health. And may He Ta'ala accept that from us. We come back with our brothers here locally at Al Masjid Al Awwal in the city of Pittsburgh and with our brothers at the Tarbiyah Initiative of South Florida, and our brothers at Masjid Quba in the city of Orlando, and our brothers and our sisters as well in all of those places at Islamic Center of Palm Beach, and all of those who join us at this hour, and all of those who join us later through the recordings, we beg Allah Ta'ala that He grant us all an increase from His bounties. We return at this time of this Saturday afternoon, the eighth day of Dhul Hijjah in the year 1437. We return to our study of Al Usul al Thalatha, the three fundamental principles authored by the great scholar Shaykh al Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab al Tamimi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, and explained by the virtuous scholar Al-Allama Muhammad ibn Salih al-Uthaymeen Rahimahullah Ta'ala May Allah have mercy on both of them We have arrived at page number 63 of the printed explanation of Al-Usul Al-Thalatha that explanation again being by Al-Shaykh ibn Uthaymeen and we have finished our discussion or our reading of the material connected to the issue of isti'ana, seeking the assistance of Allah, and matters like seeking the assistance of other than Allah, and the conditions for that to be acceptable. And then we move into another act of worship, that is the focus of the first part of our reading today, and that is al-isti'ana, al-isti'ana, to ask for refuge, protection, from certain matters. The author of Al-Usul Al-Thalatha Rahimahullah Ta'ala stated in the text of the book 
وَدَلِيلُ الْإِسْتِعَادَةِ That Hamza should not be written there again. All of the Hamzas in these nouns are to be reviewed carefully. Al-Isti'adha has no Hamza written. It's Hamza Tawasal. Al-Isti'adha. It's not Al-Isti'adha, but it's Al-Isti'adha. The evidence for that, that Isti'adha is an act of worship, قوله تعالى is the statement of Allah the Most High قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ Say, O Muhammad, I seek refuge with the Lord of the Falaq. And most of the scholars of Tafsir said Al-Falaq is the early morning daybreak. That he is the Lord of that early morning daybreak. While other scholars, there are some scholars of Tafsir said Al-Falaq is Al-Khalq, the creation, all of it. Falaq al habba the Falaq is a Khaliq. Right? And falaqa is a synonym for khalaqa, to create something. So al-falaq, as understood by the majority of the scholars of tafsir, is the daybreak, the morning daybreak, but it can also be referred to as what? The entire creation. And some of the scholars went even more specifically, and they said it is a sijin fi jahannam, a wadin fiha. It is a hold or a prison in the hellfire, or a valley in the hellfire, meaning a place in the hellfire. And Allah Ta'ala knows best. وَقُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ And another evidence for isti'adha being an act of worship is the statement of Allah Ta'ala, Say, O Muhammad, I seek refuge with the Lord of the people, an-nas. In explanation of this statement, Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih al uthaymin stated al isti'adatu Again the Hamza should not be there al isti'adatu talabu al i'adha That Hamza should be there Talabu al i'adha Seeking protection The meaning of isti'adha is to seek protection Wal i'adatu al himaya I'adha Protection is himaya Being defended or being protected from something Min makruhin from a detested matter. فَالْمُسْتَعِيذُ مُحْتَمِن So the مُسْتَعِيذُ, the one seeking the protection, he's مُحْتَمِن He is guarded and he is protected. Be مَنْ اسْتَعَادَ بِهِ Through the one that he seeks refuge with. وَمُعْتَصِمٌ بِهِ And he's مُعْتَصِم as well. مُعْتَصِم means he's protected from straying and from error by way of the thing that he's seeking refuge with. Remember, al-isti'adha is a request for refuge. It is not that you just simply take refuge whenever you like it with Allah. But rather you beg him for refuge. If he grants it, then you have isma. Then you will be protected. If Allah protects you, if Allah answers your request for refuge, then you shall be protected from misguidance and harm. If that request is not answered, then you are not protected and you don't have isma. Some people who are so ignorant, they know some Arabic, but they, they say this discussion about isma and i'tisam is wrong because you're saying that other than the prophets have isma, and from the core beliefs of Ahl Sunnah is only the prophets have isma. Only the prophets are protected from error. This is just a gross, terrible misunderstanding of that basic principle. The prophets have isma by revelation. They are ma'sumun. Not only mu'tasimun. Not only that they are seeking isma from Allah. They are ma'sumun. They are protected and granted that protection by Allah Ta'ala. Meaning, they are human beings. If they speak with a word that is not what Allah wanted from their human error, that Allah reveals revelation to them and they are protected from that word spreading and being misguidance to the people. Not that they in and of themselves are perfect, but rather they are human beings. And the difference between them and the rest of the human beings is that they have isma. They are ma'sum. 
They are protected from error. If they err, revelation comes to correct their error so that the message reaches the people intact and in a way that the people can follow. Allah Ta'ala says in the closing verses of Surah Al-Kahf, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ Say, I am just a human being like you. Say, O Muhammad, to them, I am just a human being like you. يُوحَى إِلَيَّ Revelation has been given to me. That's the isma. They have revelation from Allah. When we say the people can attain isma, it is through dua, and it is in selected instances when they beg Allah for that isma. It is not that they are ma'sumun all of their lives or something. Rather, when they beg Allah for that protection, as He Azza wa Jal said in the hadith Qudsi, the hadith of the wali, وَلَا إِنْ سَأَلَنِي لَأُعْطِيَنَّهُ وَلَا إِنْ إِسْتَعَاذَنِي لَأُعِيذَنَّهُ If he were to ask me, surely I would give him whatever he asks for. Meaning the wali, the one who has reached closeness to Allah through acts of obedience, both obligatory and supererogatory. He is a wali of Allah. If he asks Allah for a matter, then Allah grants it to him. And if he begs Allah for refuge, وَلَئِنْ إِسْتَعَاذَنِي لَأُعِيذَنَّهُ Then surely I will grant him that refuge. So he may get isma by his request being granted from Allah Ta'ala. And that isma doesn't mean he's ma'asum now and he cannot err and he cannot make a mistake and everything he says will be similar to the speech of the prophets who only spoke from revelation. Rather their isma is very limited is based on their request from Allah Ta'ala being granted to them in a specific occasion alone. Not that the people may attain the isma of the prophets, the level of the prophets and being protected from error and so on. As the very best of this ummah were the companions. Yet the companions individually could commit errors in issues of fiqh, in issues of ijtihad and so on. They weren't prophets protected from Error. They were the best of the awliya of Allah Ta'ala. فَالْمُسْتَعِيدُ مُحْتَمٍ بِمَنْ اسْتَعَاذَ بِهِ وَمُعْتَصِمٌ بِهِ So the one who seeks refuge, he's protected through the one he's seeking refuge with. وَمُعْتَصِمٌ بِهِ And he's protected from error and from misguidance through that, in a limited way. وَالْاسْتِعَادَةُ أَنْوَاعَ And this process of seeking protection is of different types. Al-awwal, the first type, al-isti'adatu, that Hamza should not be written again. Billahi ta'ala, that is to seek refuge with Allah the Most High. And it was brought to my attention many years ago that many people had the habit of translating a'udhu billah and al-isti'adatu billah as seeking refuge in Allah, which is inappropriate. Why is that? In English we say, so-and-so sought refuge in a cave. He sought refuge in a shelter. What does that mean? He went inside. But when you seek refuge with someone, the more appropriate translation of al isti'adha billahi, seeking refuge with Allah and not in Allah, it seems to be a very rigid translation that doesn't allow for the way we use our prepositions in the English language. Al-isti'adatu billahi ta'ala wa hiya al-mutadammina li kamal al-iftiqari ilayhi. And that includes a complete kind of acknowledgement from the servant that he is destitute and in great need of Allah. Wa li'atisami bihi. And that he seeks protection through him. That he seeks to be protected from error and misguidance through Allah. وَاعْتِقَادِ كِفَايَتِهِ And it must also include that he views, he believes that that is sufficient for him. Seeking refuge with Allah will suffice him no matter what he is facing. وَتَمَامِ حِمَايَتِهِ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ حَاضِرٍ أَوْ مُسْتَقْبِلٍ And that that would suffice him as protection from every matter that he presently faces or that he will face in the future. صَغِيرٍ أَوْ كَبِيرٍ Whether it's small or large. 
بشر أو غير بشر human or other than human meaning the threat from a human being or from an animal or something else ودليلها قوله تعالى and the evidence for this as an act of worship is his statement and he is the most high قل أعوذ برب الفلق say O Muhammad I seek refuge with the Lord of the daybreak من شر ما خلق from the evil that he has created إلى آخر السورة all the way to the end of Surah Al-Falaq وقوله تعالى and as well the statement of Allah the Most High قل أعوذ برب الناس say O Muhammad I seek refuge with the Lord of mankind ملك الناس the King of mankind إله الناس the deity of mankind the only one that deserves the worship of mankind من شر الوسواس الخناس from the evil of الوسواس the one who is صاحب الوسوسة the whisperer the one who continually whispers الخناس the one who withdraws so he whispers and withdraws the next ayat is الذي يوسوس the one who whispers في صدور الناس in the chests of men in the chests of all people, not heedless people or irreligious people or disobedient people, in opposition to the false tafsir of Nu'man Ali Khan for Surat An Nas, he said that nasi, the one who whispers into the chests of An Nasi, the forgetful one, An Nasi. So he said that the kesra on the scene means the Ya was there, and Nasi, the forgetful one. It doesn't work in the Arabic language to say Sudur and Nasi. The chests, plural, of the one individual forgetful person. Doesn't work. To put a Mufrad to a Mufrad, a singular noun to a singular noun. The one who whispers in the chest of the forgetful one. Not the chests, plural, of the forgetful one individual. No, it doesn't even work in the Arabic language. Yet this is the tafsir of the one that is being promoted on the internet by children as being an expert in tafsir. من الجنة والناس and الوسواس الخناس shaytan who whispers and then slips away is from the species of jinn and mankind. Both. A point of benefit that helps us understand the danger of that false tafsir is that when you believe that Al-Waswas Al-Khannas exclusively whispers into the chest of a forgetful person, you assume that the pious person is now safe from the whisperings of the shaitan. The exact opposite of the teachings of the scholars of Al-Islam. Scholars of Al-Islam, they say, the heedless one, disobedient, immersed in disobedience and heedlessness, does the shaitan come to him to whisper to him? No, the shaitan owns him. He doesn't need to whisper to him. He's already got him. Who does the shaitan need to whisper to? The pious one. The one who's careful, the one who's practicing his religion. And this is what, for example, Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salah al Uthaymin mentioned about al wasawas the whisperings that come to the chest of the people. This is something that is a sign of piety and closeness to Allah. That you have wasawas, not a sign of weakness, that you are a person who's afflicted and poor in your religion. But rather, if you have wasawas, that means the shaitan is targeting you. Why is the shaitan targeting you? Because you are on a good level and a good practice of Islam. So good news for those people who say, I feel like I'm suffering from low iman, because of wasawas, because I have whisperings that come to me from the shaitan. Rather, remember when the companions, they mentioned this to the Prophet wasallam. We have things that come to us, يَتَعَظَمُ أَحَدُنَا أَنْ يَتَكَلَّمَ بِهِ One of us could never even bring it to our lips to talk about the kind of thoughts that are being presented to us, meaning through these whisperings. So the Prophet wasallam said, أَوَجَدْتُمُوهُ you detected that. 
And they said yes. He said, Laka Sarihul Iman. That's the explicit, genuine nature of Iman, of faith right there. The fact that whisperings are taking place and you are so in tune with your heart that you detect them. Because there are other people who don't detect them. So whisper to do some evil, they just go and do it. They don't ask about it. They don't question what's happening. But here the believer, he says, what kind of thought is that? He has an internal struggle going on. He recognizes the work of al-waswas al-khannas. And it bothers him. And he detects it. That's his iman. Being able to detect that. Don't you know the people immersed in disobedience? They'll just claim, my heart is clean. Immersed up to their necks in disobedience. But they say, no, I'm clean. I love Allah in my heart, that's enough. They are totally out of touch with their heart. Yet they claim pure, soft hearts and so on. But their hearts are like rocks. They have no connection to their hearts. Every whisper from the shaytan to disobey Allah that comes to them is obeyed and never questioned. So there's no struggle within their heart. They think they have a good, clean heart. They have a corrupt heart. A heart that is in tune to disobedience. A heart that is inclined towards disobedience. A heart that is accustomed to and used to as a routine disobedience. A heart that is disturbed by obedience. A heart that is, it's problematic for this heart now to obey Allah and to shun those wasalas. Those whisperings that come to the chest now become the routine. We follow them and we follow after our heart. Don't you see the corrupt, bankrupt, sexually deviant people and all kinds of deviant people in the West when the people have freedom of speech? What do they say about living free and things? Follow your heart. You have to be a free person. You have to go out and follow your heart. They teach people through their romance novels and their stories they teach young girls, you have to follow your heart. If you're married to a man and he doesn't really ignite your fire like he used to, and you see another man and you fall in love with that man, you have to leave this husband of yours and you have to chase your heart. This is what they teach the people from a young age. Chase your heart. Love conquers everything. What do they mean by love conquers everything? Hawa. Shehwa. The burning desire that the shaitan puts in your heart for what is disobedience. You must follow this. These are wasawas. The people of disobedience become so accustomed to it that they wish that to be the norm. That what makes a person truly free and truly good in his soul is that he follows after his heart. Don't you see that's what every homosexual says? I have to be true to myself. I have to follow my heart. What is he following? al waswas al khannas the evil whisperings of his sworn enemy. But he says, I need to be true to myself. I can't fake who I am. I have to be a homosexual. Because it means bravery and being true. It means sincerity. That's what it is. And, you know, being a person who repels those thoughts, that's hypocrisy. Look how everything has turned upside down once the heart becomes corrupt. Wholesome manners, upright behavior is hypocrisy. Restraining yourself being dissimilar to animals, not following every whim. This is now what? Hypocrisy and weakness. And what is courageous behavior? What is, you know, what is uh, freedom? What is uh, following your heart and being a true spirited individual? What is it? Going after every filthy whim that comes to your heart. You seek refuge with Allah Ta'ala from al-waswas al khannat these matters are very important for us in the West to understand that it's the Adam, it's reality, the surahs and falaq and nas, for us to be reciting them after our salawat and khams, for us to understand their meanings and not to allow simple people without principles in Islam to come and corrupt the meanings of al muawwadatain the two surahs and falaq and nas. As our understanding of them is essential for us to be on guard against our sworn enemy. For someone to teach you that if you're pious and you're a person who makes a lot of mention of Allah, then the shaitan has no way to your heart. Because he's the one He's the one who whispers into the chest of forgetful people. Not you, the pious one. The one who prays in the masjid and the one who takes care of your salah and the one who gives in charity and the one who remembers Allah. This does what? This gets you to put your guard down against your true enemy. 
and say, so long as I've done all these acts of piety, then I'm not nasty. I'm not a forgetful person. I'm not a heedless person. So the shaitan won't whisper to my chest. The reality is the more pious you are, the more you draw close to Allah, the more the shaitan needs to target you. The more the shaitan will whisper to your chest, as was found in the reports of the companions. And Allah Ta'ala knows best. So the first category of al isti'adha is isti'adha with Allah Ta'ala. My apologies for speaking much when we should be reading the words of our scholar here. But there are some times when things need to be relevant to us in, in the West, and I hope that what I've said is in line with that. Athani al isti'adatu bi sifatin min sifatihi. The second kind of isti'adha, to seek refuge with Allah as an act of worship is to seek refuge with Him through one of His attributes. كَكَلَامِهِ Like when you seek refuge with the kalam, the speech of Allah. وَعَظَمَتِهِ His greatness. وَعِزَّتِهِ And His honor. وَنَحْوِ ذلك. And similar things like other attributes. وَدَلِيلُ ذلك. The evidence for that. قوله صلى الله عليه وسلم أعوذ بكلمات الله التامات من شر ما خلق. I seek refuge with the kalimat of Allah. Notice this is not أعوذ بالله من شر ما خلق. This is أعوذ بكلمات الله التامات. I seek refuge with the perfect words of Allah from the evil of what He has created. This hadith was. Collected by Al Imam Muslim in his Sahih. And it's important to mention the occasion for this dua. What is the occasion for this dua? Anyone know? When do you say this dua? It has a specific occasion. Lodging, ahsant. When you're traveling and you stop during your journey to spend the night somewhere, whether it is setting up a tent. Or in modern times, taking a hotel room. When you take your lodging for the night, as the Prophet ﷺ said, in the, this is the hadith, it's the hadith of Khawla bint Hakim as Sulamiya. As we mentioned, it was collected by an Imam Muslim. This is the narration. She said that the Prophet ﷺ said, Man nazala manzila, whoever stops at a certain place, a manzil, a place of nuzul during your journey, which will become clear from the other narrations. ثم قال, and then he says, أعوذ بكلمات الله التامات من شر ما خلق. I seek refuge with the perfect words of Allah from the evil of what He has created. لم يضره شيء حتى يرتحل من منزله ذلك. Nothing will harm him at that place until he moves on in his journey from that resting place, from that menzil. And it's also been narrated from the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, as well collected by an Imam Muslim. قَالَ جَاءَ رَجُلٌ إِلَى النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ A man came to the Prophet, may Allah raise his rank and grant him peace. وَقَالَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, مَا لَقِيتُ مِنْ عَقْرَبٍ لَذَا غَدْنِ الْبَارِحَةِ He complained of a pain that he had from a scorpion bite from the previous night. The Prophet ﷺ said, أَمَا لَوْ قُلْتَ هِينَ أَمْسَيْتِ Had you only said, when evening came, أَعُوذُ بِكَلِمَاتِ اللَّهِ التَّامَاتِ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خلق. I seek refuge with the perfect words of Allah from the evil of what He has created. لَمْ يَدُرَّكْ Then that would not have harmed you. Adding to that what's important since we're in an aqidah class, what shows the importance of learning foundations, the Jahmiyyah came and they tried to claim the Mu'tazila. And the Jahmiya came and they tried to claim that the Qur'an was created. And it was not the speech of Allah, not His attribute. Aside from clear textual evidence from the Book of Allah, وَإِنْ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ اسْتَجَارَكَ فَأَجِرْهُ حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ 
And if any of the polytheists seek asylum with you, seek a kind of protection from you, then grant him protection so he can hear the kalam of Allah. Allah has called the Qur'an being recited by the Prophet ﷺ in that verse, kalam Allah, the speech of Allah. And he has said, وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا and so on. And Allah has spoken to Musa with real speech and so on. Too many verses to count. Look at the result. This hadith is so significant. This dua, this seeking refuge with the words of Allah is so significant because it shows you the lazim of falsehood. It shows you what is logically required if you accept a false principle. The false belief would be that the Qur'an is created. The speech of Allah is created. It's not His attribute. That's the false principle. If we built on that, then what are we doing when we say, أَعُوذُ بِكَلِمَاتِ اللَّهِ التَّامَاتِ I seek refuge with the perfect words of Allah. We're seeking refuge with a creation, not the Creator. Because remember, they're saying the speech of Allah is created, not the Creator. So now we're seeking refuge with the creation. Build on that. Who taught us this dua? The Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Messenger of Allah taught us to seek refuge with the creation. This goes all the way back to Allah sent us a messenger to call us to Tawheed and then He taught us to commit shirk. The same messenger that He sent to teach us to only worship Him and never seek refuge with anyone other than Allah as an act of worship. He also taught us to seek refuge with His created speech. Look at the tanafat, look at the, the clear contradiction in usul. Look at the, the falsehood that is built upon falsehood. If you accept the premise that the Qur'an is created, now you'll be saying, I seek refuge with the creation of Allah from evil. Now an evil thing comes to me, instead of seeking refuge with Allah, I seek refuge with another thing from the creation, from this created thing that is a danger to me. Subhanallah. So now shirk in action comes from shirk in belief. Subhanallah. Seeking Refuge with a creation is shirk in action. The disbelief in i'tiqad, in belief, rejecting the ayah that clearly established the Qur'an as the speech of Allah. And the Salaf, they said, Qur'anu kalam Allah ghayru makhluk. They said the Qur'an is the speech of Allah, it is not a created thing. Min hu bada wa ilayhi ya'ud. From him the Qur'an came to us and to him it returns. That's the aqidah of Ahl sunnah in opposition to the aqidah of the Jahmiyyah and the Mu'tazila and many of the modern day Ash'aris and deviants of this day and time. Wallahu al-musta'an. The first evidence from the sunnah of seeking refuge with an attribute of Allah, having the same ruling as seeking refuge with Allah Himself, that you may seek refuge with Allah's attributes, and that is seeking refuge with Allah the one who has those attributes. وَقَوْلُهُ أَعُوذُ بِعَظَمَتِكَ أَنْ أُغْتَالَ مِنْ تَحْتِي I seek refuge with your greatness from being tricked or being taken from under me. That's from a narration in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad and Sunan al-Nasai. وَقَوْلُهُ فِي دُعَاءِ الْأَلَمِ And he said, or his statement as well, the statement of the Messenger of Allah, may Allah raise his rank and grant him peace, in the supplication for someone who has pain. I seek refuge in the honor of Allah and in his capabilities. From the evil of what I find, what I detect of pain, what I sense of pain, and what I I'm worried about happening, what I am on guard against. Meaning, I have pain now and I worry that this pain may increase. Or I worry that other pains and other physical symptoms may show up. So I have pain and I have worry about more bigger symptoms coming. So you seek refuge with the honor of Allah and His capabilities from the evil of what you sense and what you are afraid of coming. And that's from 
the Musnad of Imam Ahmad and others. And this comes from the narration of Uthman ibn Abil As, radiallahu anhu, who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught them to say, وَقُلْ سَبْعَ مَرَّاتٍ Say this seven times. أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ وَقُدْرَتِهِ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا أَجِدُ وَأُحَادِرُ I seek refuge with Allah and His Qudrah and His capabilities from the evil of what I sense, of what I can feel, and what I am afraid of. There are differences in the narrations now. The one in the text, the one mentioned by Shaykh Ibn Uthaymeen, mentions Izza and Qudra. And this one I've given you the wording which is found in Sahih Muslim. Yeah, the wording which is found in Sahih Muslim. And the one referenced by Shaykh Ibn Uthaymeen is referenced to Al-Imam Ahmad wa Abu Dawood wa Ibn Majah. And I added the information of it being the narration of Uthman ibn Abil Aas and that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to say that seven times when a person is encountering pain. وَقَوْلُهُ And his statement sallallahu alayhi wa sallam أَعُوذُ بِرِضَاكَ مِنْ سَخَطِكَ I seek refuge with your pleasure from your anger. That's also from Sahih Muslim. Also, right after that, وَمُعَافَاتِكَ مِنْ عُقُوبَتِكَ And I seek refuge with your safety that you provide from your punishment. So more refuge with matters, with attributes of Allah Ta'ala that show you are allowed, it is from your tawheed, it is from your worship of Allah alone, that you seek refuge with Allah, either directly saying, أَعُوذُ billah or that you seek refuge with Allah, mentioning any of His perfect and complete attributes. وَقَوْلُهُ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ حِينَ نَزَرَ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى And His statement, May Allah raise His rank and grant Him peace, which is collected in Sahih al-Bukhari, that He said when Allah revealed this verse, قُلْ هُوَ الْقَادِرُ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَبَعَثَ عَلَيْكُمْ عَذَابًا مِنْ فَوْقِكُمْ Say, O Muhammad, He is the one fully capable of sending down upon you a punishment from above you, from Surah Al-An'am, the 65th verse, فَقَالَ أَعُوذُ بِوَجْهِكَ I seek refuge with your face. Another attribute of Allah Ta'ala. So we have a number of evidences here from this great Imam, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, helping us to understand that it is perfectly fine and in line with our tawheed, our worship of Allah alone, that we seek refuge with the attributes of Allah or with Allah Ta'ala Himself. Athalith, the third kind of seeking refuge, al isti'adatu bil amwati, aw bil ahya'i ghayr al hadirin al qadirin ala al awdi. To seek refuge with the dead or with those who are alive, who are either not present or not capable of granting you any protection. فَهَذَا شِرْكٌ This is an act of shirk, polytheism. وَمِنْهُ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى And from this is the statement of Allah, وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ رِجَالٌ مِنَ الْإِنسِ يَهُذُونَ بِرِجَالٍ مِنَ الْجِنِّ فَزَادُوهُمْ رَهَقًا There have been some people, some males from amongst the people, seeking refuge with some males from the jinn, and that only increased them in transgression and evil. Rahab is what? Tughyan and sharr, transgression and evil. That's from Surah Al-Jinn, the sixth verse. Ar-Rabi'u, the fourth kind of isti'ada, the fourth and final kind mentioned here by the shaykh, is al-isti'adatu bima yumkin al-awdu bihi min al-makhluqeen that is to seek refuge with those who can provide refuge they have the ability to provide some kind of protection or refuge min al-makhluqeen from the created beings min al-bashari of people aw al-amakin or places aw ghayriha or anything else fahada ja'izun this is allowed Seeking refuge in a cave, seeking refuge in a shelter, seeking refuge in a bus stop when it's raining, seeking refuge in a building from the weather, and so on. Seeking refuge. It's isti'an. And it's not shirk, it's not polytheism. 
فهذا جائز ودليله قوله صلى الله عليه وسلم في ذكر الفتن and the evidence for this being permissible is his statement may Allah raise his rank and grant him peace when he mentioned fitan and to rewind you to the beginning of the hadith just before we take you to where Shaykh Ibn Thaymin began to quote it from the beginning of the hadith is as reported by Abu Hurairah he said the Prophet وسلم, said فتنون, there shall come trials fitan tribulations the one who's sitting in those tribulations those trials and those clashes the one who's sitting is better than the one who's standing and the one standing is better than the one walking in those trials and the one walking is better than the one running the one moving quickly. Man tasharrafa laha. Now comes the part quoted by the Shaykh here. Man tasharrafa laha tastashrifhu. Whoever faces it or embraces that fitna, openly accepts that fitna, then it will destroy him. Woman wajada maljaan aw ma'adan. Whoever finds a place of luju, a malja you know, taking some kind of protection, or a ma'ad, a place of refuge, bihi. let him seek refuge in it. Muttafaqun alayhi, it is agreed upon, meaning collected by both Imams, al-Bukhari and Muslim. وَقَدْ بَيَّنَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ هَذَا الْمَلْجَى He, may Allah raise his rank and grant him peace, further clarified what this place of refuge is. It helps us understand the permissibility of seeking refuge with a place. Not Allah, but seeking refuge in a cave or in a place. Here in this case, the malja wal ma'ath and the place of refuge. بِقَوْلِهِ with his statement, فَمَنْ كَانَ لَهُ إِبِلٌ So whoever of you, or whoever has camels, meaning has a pen, he has a pasture, he has a farm. فَلْيَلْحَقْ بِإِبْلِهِ And let him go join his camels. And what that's a reference to is, a man may be a city dweller, but he has a farm, or he has a patch of land somewhere, some acres of land, where he has a pen for camels. He may have a shepherd that he hires to watch over them, and to take them out every day. So if that's the case, if a person has this, then go out there, in the time of fitna. الحديث رواه مسلم وفي صحيحه أيضا عن جابر رضي الله عنه The hadith was narrated by Imam Muslim and in his authentic compilation also is the report of جابر May Allah be pleased with him أن امرأة من بني مخزوم سرقت That a woman from the tribe of مخزوم she stole something فَأُتِيَ بِهَا النَّبِيَّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَعَاذَتْ بِأُمِّ سَلَمْ When she was brought to the Prophet, may Allah raise his rank and grant him peace, she sought refuge with Ummi Salam. She sought refuge with a person here. I mean, she asked for the protection and help of Ummu Salam. Al-Hadithu wa fi sahihi, that narration, again found in Sahih Muslim. وَفِي صَحِيحِهِ أَيْضًا Also in his authentic compilation, that's the compilation of an Imam Muslim, عَنْ أُمِّ سَلَمَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهَا On the authority of Ummu Salama, may Allah be pleased with her, عَنْ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ From the Prophet, may Allah raise his rank and grant him peace, قَالَ يَعُوذُ عَائِذٌ بِالْبَيْتِ فَيُبْعَثُ إِلَيْهِ بَعْثٌ There shall come a man, he shall take refuge at the house, meaning at the Kaaba. And an army shall be sent to him. Troops shall be dispatched in his direction. And the hadith goes on, فَإِذَا كَانُوا بِبَيْدَاء مِنَ الْأَرْضِ خُسِفَ بِهِمْ They reach a plain, and all of them will be swallowed up by the earth. O Messenger of Allah, all of them will be swallowed up. Even the, the one who was forced to go with them, those who are not with them in their evil mission, 
And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, all of them will be swallowed up and every one of them will be sent forth or dispatched, brought back to Allah based on his individual niyyah. A very important hadith. The Shaykh continues here and we'll end with this statement from him today. وَلَكِنْ إِذَا اسْتَعَادَ مِنْ شَرِّ ظَالِمٍ And if a person seeks refuge from the evil of an oppressor, وَجَبَ إِوَاؤُهُ It's obligatory to give him protection. Someone is being oppressed and harmed and he's asking for your protection, it's obligatory to provide that protection. وَإِعَادَتُهُ بِقَدْرِ الْإِمْكَانِ and to protect him as much as you are able. وَإِنْ اسْتَعَادَ لِيَتَوَصَّلَ إِلَى فِعْلِ مَحْذُورٍ If he seeks protection from you in order to be able to commit some kind of impermissible action, أو الْحَرَبِ مِنْ وَاجِبٍ Or in order to flee from an obligation, حَرُمَ إِوَاءُهُ it's impermissible to grant that refuge. It's not allowed for you to grant that refuge. The Shaykh mentions this from the generality of وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى And cooperate together upon righteousness and piety. So when someone seeks your refuge from an evil matter, and he is an innocent person, then provide him with that refuge so much as you are able, because that is from the generality of cooperation upon righteousness and piety. But if there is a criminal that is being sought after because of his murder or his crime or some kind of atrocity or oppression, and even if he's your Muslim brother and he says, I need a place to hide out, he's attacked someone, he's been aggressive, he's committed crimes, and he comes to you and he says, I need a place to stay. I'm on the run. What do you do here? You do not cooperate in matters of sin and transgression. So you do not provide refuge for someone who is a criminal or has committed an act of oppression. And Allah Ta'ala knows best. This is what Allah Ta'ala has made easy for us to come together and study this afternoon. The question is about the companions and what I said about them, that they are not protected from error. This is a good, another good uh, comment to add. That that means individually the issues mentioned, the examples given were in issues of fit, in issues of ijtihad. And I think that was understood there that that's individual companions, perhaps erring in an issue here and there. And it becomes clear through that that they weren't prophets upon revelation, that they were followers of a prophet upon revelation, so they were not protected from human errors. However, there is a time when we say the companions are protected from error. And what does that mean? In a general way, in a broad way, when the companions agreed on an issue, that's called ijma, ijma al-sahaba. The companions agreeing on something, it is the truth and it is a binding proof in the religion. Not for anyone to say, well, let's look at the evidences. Once the companions agreed upon a matter, that's the deen of Allah Ta'ala. Now, very important to know. So the ijma of the companions, and the ijma of the ummah in general, even those after the companions, the tabi'een, the imams of the deen, when an issue comes up and all of the scholars who are noted for their knowledge, respected for their level of knowledge and their understanding, they all agree upon a matter that it's not permissible to contradict that after that point. And most of the ijma takes place in those early years amongst the sahaba and the tabi'een. However, there are issues of ijma that took place later or weren't known until later. Meaning they were differed over for a certain time and then they were agreed upon after that. And Allah Ta'ala knows best. لَا تَجْتَمِعُوا أُمَّتِي عَلَى ضَلَالَةً My ummah does not unite upon error. That's a proof for al-ijma. In the statement of Allah Ta'ala وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقَ الرَّسُولَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى Whoever contradicts the messenger after clear guidance has been conveyed to him. They said that's mukhalafat al-nas, opposing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ السَّبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And he follows a way other than the way of the believers. They said that's al-ijma, that's the consensus of the Muslims. سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ What's the result of doing either of those two actions? 
نوليه ما تولى ونصله جهنم وساءت مصيرا will turn him to what he has turned himself to and enter him into Jahannam, the hellfire, what an evil abode. We seek refuge and protection from Allah Ta'ala. And Allah Ta'ala knows best. So now when I said that companions were not infallible, I meant their individual opinions. But as a body of companions, their ijma, their consensus is infallible and it is deen. And Allah Ta'ala knows best. And the companions and the issue of the companions, it's always an important matter to be precise in our speech regarding that. As an Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, he said in his Usul al-Sunnah, the very opening of Usul al-Sunnah. What is it? The very first statement in Usul al-Sunnah is the Sunnah in that What? Say what ma ja'a bihi. أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أو كما قال رحمه الله the sunnah according to us that means the correct deen according to us it is what the companions were upon والاقتداء بهم and to follow them the companions and their status loving them and honoring them and mentioning their virtue all of these matters are beautiful matters in our religion and we thank Allah Ta'ala for success وصلي اللهم وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين